tuning in to the online broadcast network, AfterBuzz TV. Over 20 million weekly downloads in over 150 countries and your number one source for after show entertainment. Oh, AfterBuzz TV. After Buzz TV. The destination for TV superfans. Producing after shows for over 300 of your favorite TV shows. Interviewing celebrities and showrunners. And bringing you behind the scenes exclusives. All thanks to E! Entertainment's Maria Menounos, producer Kevin Undergaro, and internet leader Akamai. Now, let the buzz! Begin. What is up, gladiators? Welcome to another Scandal After Show here at AfterBuzz, your favorite after show. We are doing Scandal Episode 7, Baby Made a Mess, and we are so excited to be here. As always, I am Emil Ennis Jr., and we are here with... Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Cornelia. Hi, I'm Sophia Stanley. Bam Erickson. And we have a very special guest in studio today. You may know him from Scandal as Ethan, Mr. Vanya Asher. How are you? Hello, hello. I'm good. How are you guys doing? We are doing great, especially after that episode. Yeah, so no, right. <laughs> he's going to be joining the conversation, giving us some inside scoop and good things like that. But before we get into this, guys, this episode was so freaking good. It was so freaking amazing. This episode was absolutely beautiful. And the minute the episode was over, I said to everyone, one, that episode was beautiful. (laughs) Two, it possibly is now my top three favorite episodes of Scandal season one, season two, season three, and season four. And three, and if you watch this show, you know how this is going to resonate. I actually don't know how I'm going to do the recap. It was that beautiful and that complete that... I'm speechless. Well, I chose a good week to come on. Right? <laughs> oh, don't worry. Yeah. Right. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> we'll figure it out. Um, I think the reason why this episode was so powerful for me is because we got to see different sides of so many different characters, and there were so many moments where I got emotional. And so we're going to go ahead and dive in with Abby. So in this episode, Abby had a flash throwback Thursday out of this world where she's now faced with her ex-husband who's now brought into office as a potential candidate to become senator because of this scandal that we have with Senator McDonald. Hence the title, Baby Made a Mess, which is pretty hilarious. But he's brought back into the White House, and Abby, I love that she tried to put on that braid face when he first, or she first saw him, but then it was so hard to see the breakdown of Abby when she had to call Olivia and she was under the desk and dealing with that, so... Before we get into you know what happened after that, what do you guys think about how the situation went down, how she handled it in the White House? I think she handled it the best she could. I mean, you never unless you've been abused in a relationship, you don't know what you would do if you were faced with the person who did that to you. Because we didn't even know that she still had a metal screw or you know something in her jaw because she was beaten that bad. So. I think she did the best that she could because I don't, you know, either you're scared or you panic or either you go crazy and you kill them or you or you punch them in the face. So I think she did what was best for her. It was just sad to see her under the desk like yeah, that. And that she, was one of the saddest yeah, scenes. That... It was really sad. So she redeemed herself, though. Mm-hmm. I will get to that. That was a though. beautiful scene, though. That was one of my favorite scenes I've seen in a long time between Olivia and Abby. And I just I like seeing them working together. I, I missed that, and I, I, I'm glad that it's back. <laughs> I like how, you know, last week, Abby was there for Liv. Now, Liv is there for Abby, so they now have squashed all that. Why are you calling me? Don't be call- that whole s- s- silliness that they had going back on and forth when they would call each other. And, and so when certain things happen in, in, in relationships, you tend to forget about the silliness about, well, why are you calling me or well, who's calling and, and all that other stuff. It's totally been, um, uh, it's been uh, forgot about because there's more important things. And so I like that. Um, yeah. Well, it's, they're always there for each other yeah. in a crisis. Like at the end of the day, obviously they both have such strong reasons for wanting to be apart from each other and mm-hmm. they're working on different sort of what are there's a line in the sand and they're on different sides but when they need to come together they do and i think it's it's so it's that like old opa i remember when i first started watching the show just like that that energy between them you can mm-hmm. see a little bit of it again obviously in like a in a horrifying situation but that scene behind the desk i'm still like uh like it was 
Yeah. yeah. And, and I agree. And I think that, Vanya, you touched on something when you said it felt like the old OPA. And it's something that we've talked about before. It's because OPA isn't simply a company. It right. isn't simply a job. It isn't, it isn't simply somewhere that you, you go to work and then you leave. It's a family. And I think that this episode solidified how much Abby and Olivia are family, mm-hmm. number one, mm-hmm. first and foremost. And I think that, and we've talked about this you know, several times, and I think more, more so me than anyone else, I think that I'm extremely hard on the characters. And I'm extremely hard on the characters doing things that make sense and, or, and are organic and natural. And for me, and I think you can even tell by the tone of my voice, that scene with Abby at the desk was beyond emotional because I can't even fathom what that must be like to have been abused on that level and have reached the level that you've reached where you are the press secretary for the United States of America and you walk in and have to put on a professional face and in theory back the man who almost killed you Mm -hmm. and if not for your friend you would either be dead or still in this bu- an abusive relationship, I felt the way in which she broke down and threw up on herself and needed live and was expressing it, not only did it resonate with me, it also resonated with something that Brian Lesher said when he was here, that it's the dichotomy between yourself sacrificing for yourself or sacrificing for the republic. And even in the midst of that agony and how scared she was, she still was able to rationalize why her abusive, sadistic ex-husband should in fact be elected because it would be good for the republic. Mm -hmm. I was like, I can't. I I, I can't with you because you're, I, I, I could not fathom that I could be that selfless and give myself and my sanity to the Republic in the manner in which he did. And like anything that I've ever said bad about Abby in this individual moment, I have to take away because it was beautiful and Darby beyond bravo, bravo. Oh, she killed bravo. it. She killed it. I bow down. I just, I, I, I'm in awe. I want to speak. I want to speak about the the scene in the garage. So, if you you know I'm a movie buff. What did that scene remind you of? What's love got to do with it, right? Mm-hmm. When after Anna May decide to leave Ike, she's been the kids and, in the car. And no, no, this is when mm, this, is, this is when he came back well, because at he the performing at the hotel. And he, oh. yeah. And oh. Ike wanted he wanted her back. Mm-hmm. And it's so interesting how people who are in that position that do harm to other people, they tend to forget or want the other person to forget or let go what they've done. And he did the same thing that I did where he literally had the nerve to like touch her, like grab her as if you don't recall all the times you beat the hell out this woman. Because that's what abusers do. They recall. They, yeah, they do recall. They know, and they don't care. And I and, and I like Abby had the same moment when uh when when uh when when Tina said, you know, I was wondering when the real Ike Turner was gonna come back. And you saw when he touched her, that's basically what he did. He went back. He he literally almost reverted back to his old ways. But luckily, she had the gun, and she had to let him know, like, look, you don't affect me like that anymore. And I think that's the scene I was waiting for because I think we were all watching that and we saw the fear in her face and her eyes and I was waiting for that moment where she fights back or does something to show him that I'm not the same Abby that I was when you did all these things to me. Because when she was leaning over in the car, I'm like, girl, either get in the car or do something. And then we, she came out with the gun. I'm like, okay, that's the Abby that we know and love now. Um, but besides the the, you know, progression that we're seeing with Abby and Olivia's relationship and then how uh, her relationship changed with Chip. We have this interesting thing that happened with Leo, Mm -hmm. which I wasn't expecting at all um, because, you know, Leo is, you know, that he's a bit of a douche sometimes. um, And Leo's that person where his client is her ex-husband and he's trying to, you know, do what's best. He's in the White House. He's trying to make this happen. And there was that scene in the office where Leo's talking to Abby and he's talking about how, you know, oh, we got Susan. Susan's not going to win now because she was a, she's not a widow. She wasn't Yahtzee. married. Right. <laughs> the Republicans aren't going to go for that. That's immoral. Mm-hmm. But then when Abby starts li- listing the things that her ex-husband did to her, 
I didn't think that Leo was going to be the one to actually turn his client in and make it seem like he did this stuff for McDonald, and that's the reason why he did. So I, I wasn't expecting that. But even beyond that, I was definitely not expecting the kiss at the very end either. Were you? So this is my issue with Leo. Oh, gosh. Here we go. So here we oh. go. So um, I understand. Okay, so Leo, is he, he's sweet for Abby, okay? Mm-hmm. His actions were maybe 50% pure genuine, but the other, I feel the other 50% had to do with the fact that he needed to now secure his, um, he needed to secure his, his, um, what's the word I'm looking for? He had to secure something in order to kind of, you know, get his position, his position with Abby. And for me, for him to leak the information to get rid of his, the ex-husband, that's a bitch ass to me because what? you don't. It, it, it's a, he that was a bitch move. Wait, okay, wait, okay, wait, okay, okay. Let Let me, ahead, Emil. It's a bitch move, and let me tell you why. It's a bitch move because you don't you don't do dirt. You don't grab dirt. Now I understand the nature of 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 what he did to her, but you don't go and throw dirt in order to get the and in, in order to get the girl. You don't do that. I don't. But I don't think he's throwing dirt to get the girl. Like if somebody came to me, but he leaked. But he leaked information. He Information, information he, because on, she but, was beat. Right, but he leaked information. <laughs> right. Then you go to her, and then the next thing you do, you get a kiss from her, and then you I do mean, the whole thing. The, the, first, nah, but he was dumb. drinking Kentucky cool. bourbon, though, just for so care. So he's a little cool. tipsy. I don't care if you're not tipsy, but it, it shows that, okay, like, what's really your motive? Well, I would say that just because of everything we've seen from Leo, he's always had that. He walks with the permanent side eye. Because first he was with Sally, and he was doing Sally's dirt. Mm-hmm. Then now he's in here, and he's doing Chip's dirt. Now he, you know, is pushing up on Abby. So I get both sides. I wouldn't, I'm not going to say he's completely bad in regards to Abby. I gave him 50%. But I would, I'm going, I would keep my eye on him because, again, Abby could just be another pawn because everybody that we've seen Leo working with has been a pawn. We haven't seen him being like this great, genuine guy. And if you a douche all the time, I mean, I'm going to be led to believe that you're a yeah. douche all the time. But that's his job too, right? Like it's, it's how you deal with dirt. Like he was brought in in the first place to deal with dirt. Mm-hmm. And th- th- this episode, I feel like it dealt with that a lot. Obviously, like Cyrus had dirt to deal with as well. Mm-hmm. And so I think like like throwing it up into someone's face who is clearly a villain. It's totally acceptable. That's part of the job requirement of sort of like almost anyone that steps into the White House at this point. At least that's the way that, that the, the world that, that scandal is built, the way that they're presenting it. Yeah. So like, I, I don't see, I mean, for me, it's like, yeah, he was dealt dirt and then he dealt with it back. So it's kind of like, expect it as much and then you're like yeah hell yeah and I kind of like the resolution we had with this because there is a scene right before this where uh, Abby was talking to Olivia <laughs> and Abby was saying or Olivia was saying oh you have a, you have the podium you can stand up you can talk about what he did to you you have the power now and then she said well look where Monica Lewinsky is now or Anita looks like so, Anita Hill yeah, yeah. yeah. so it's true. like mm-hmm. I'm glad that I, in a way like I'm it was nice to see that somebody stood up for Abby in a different way because Abby was just going to continue to take on that pain and she was just going to keep a straight face and put on a, a front and act like nothing happened. And I have people that I'm close friends with who are still doing that because they don't want to hurt the other person. They don't want to ruin the other person's career because they still love that person but in a different way. They don't. They can't love them in the way they did before, but they still don't want to hurt them. But what I love also about what Abby did at and I think it, that was a running theme through this episode. It was like, for the best of the Republic. Mm-hmm. And it's something that obviously Tom's beautiful monologue touches on kind of amazingly. Mm-hmm. That everyone during the episode was doing something for the good of the Republic. So whether it's like Rowan or whether in this case Abby wasn't, I don't think it was so much for the sake of her ex-husband right. at all. I mean, like she said to herself, she wanted to shoot him. It would have felt good to shoot him. But she has to think about the Republic, and that's sort of like all. Everyone seemed to have made choices in this episode based on based on that want or that need. And we love the choices that you guys make on iTunes. So we want to um, make sure that you guys continue to go on iTunes, rate, comment, subscribe, tell a friend. Um, just as we're having the conversation, we're agreeing and disagreeing. Please share your comments on i uh, on iTunes. Let us know if you agree with me. Uh, if you disagree with me, we welcome and accept all comments. So make sure you guys go to iTunes, subscribe, rate, comment, and please tell your friends, family, and everyone that you know. <laughs> Indeed. Mm-hmm. Um, and now speaking of choices, Melly has been making a lot of choices recently. 
via the influence of Lizzie Bear, but she's making a lot of choices. And in this episode, um, we have this bombing in West Angola outside the embassy, and so we find out that they're going to send in Truman, and then Cyrus, who found out that his leak is in the back door, <laughs> sounds so funny saying that, but his leak is in the back door, uh, Cyrus then goes to leak that information to Michael, but he tells him that it's... Um, the Roosevelt. Yeah, the Roosevelt, Roosevelt instead. Roosevelt, yeah. So, Ethan comes in later in the episode, and he tells Cyrus that I couldn't find anything, because Cyrus tells him the research, I couldn't find anything about Western Angola, and then we have this scene with Melly, where Melly is on her platform talking about the China and the tradition and stuff, and then she talks about West Angola, how she's so proud of her husband, who's going to send in the Roosevelt, and then we see... Cyrus have his moment. So, what do you guys want to think about Melly and how she? Do you think Melly is? Because I, I guess she said she's back now. Melly's back, and you know, used to hate old Melly, but I feel like Melly's just being easily manipulated right now. Not only is she being easily man- manipulated, she's being sloppy. Yeah, you don't take your information from one person, i.e., Lizzie Bear. You are an accomplished, intelligent lawyer. Do your research. You don't have interns. You're not going to jump online. Like, you don't have have white papers, briefings, stuff, right? To literally leak the specific name of the ship, that has to be some form of treason isn't the appropriate word, but you're overstepping, Mm -hmm. even for the First Lady, because even within the context of cabinet members, not all cabinet members are privy to that information, number one. Number two, to disclose it on national TV... She's slipping. She's messy. Even though I want Melly to make her move, that move was sloppy. But Melly, remember Cyrus said it last season, when you give Melly a bone, yeah. she'll run with it, but she'll be her own downfall. Mm-hmm. Melly always, she does this. Melly needs to, you ever meet, like, see that little boy who just runs too fast for his body? <laughs> you know what I mean? He, he has the big head, and he, like, runs and falls over. <laughs> That's Melly. She she means well, and I, and she could she could um, she could attack each situation with precision. But she gets too excited. Melly is just happy to be back, and now she's just gonna be the, the White House troublemaker. And because of what Bitsy Bitsy gassed her up, now she's on this whole new. Uh, this whole new uh, adventure in the White House. We still are talking about a woman though that's like that has lost a kid, which I think that that's something like. I mean. I thought when we were reading the script that the table of reads and everything, it was the way that they dealt with that topic was beautiful because it wasn't it wasn't swept under the rug. We're still dealing with it and we're almost towards, you know, like we're in episode seven today. Mm-hmm. And it's something that like you know, there's I think the writers did a great job too because sud you know, she's back, but as kind of what you're saying is like it's a question of whether she did it what whether she was messy about it or not. But, like, she's making her first steps back that are sort of, like, an attempt at, at, at regaining some kind of a foothold for herself as an, as a, as an identity, which I kind of loved. Excellent but, point. But I also think that, you know, this is the second time that she's run her mouth publicly um, in, true, in, yeah. in, in, um, in this season. And her husband, the president of the United States, <laughs> has yet to... I don't want to say check her because that's not no, the appropriate he tried word. To. He tried yeah. He tried to. <laughs> But what, what is he going to say to Melly? Because, I mean, especially but, right but, when he was about to open and say something, but maybe, his phone rang. And it's but, Olivia. But maybe right. maybe take a different approach because if she continues to run her mouth, she's mm-hmm. going to – this is this is going to affect you. So I feel – do you, do, you, do you think that Fitz should maybe take a different approach? Completely. So that she can have something to do? Completely. Well, but I think the problem is is that somewhere along the line – Fitz, like in his core of cores, does not respect Melly. Yeah, that's true. Whoever she used to be, the partner of the law firm when he first married her, this formidable presence, he that that person is dead and buried and long gone, and he really only sees smelly Melly, crybaby Melly, and so forth and so on. And despite the fact that that came about because she lost a child, despite the fact that it was only two months of a twenty-year marriage, like she says, mm-hmm. he doesn't respect her. He doesn't respect her as a wife. He doesn't respect her as the first lady. I don't even think he respects her as a woman, and more importantly, he doesn't respect her as an intellectual, intelligent being. Therefore, I think he's not he doesn't even value her enough to give her something of substance 
to do so she doesn't make mistakes like yeah. USS Roosevelt. Well, and then he still sees her as ornamental because the very first thing he says when he comes outside is, you were supposed to be talking about China. But I have to point these two things out before we move on to Cyrus. Um, she did say in this episode, which I loved, she said um, earlier... I like how she said when there's a the first woman president, that oh, first yeah. like the first lady that that's gonna be a paid position now because when the man's in that position, they're not gonna just let him not get paid. It's gonna be like a real position. Mm-hmm. But then also, we can't um, not talk about what she said to Fitz. She said, you know, I've been holding up these walls for 20 years, and then I fall down for two months, and all of a sudden. And when she said that the 20 years part, it looked like a fly just landed on his nose. Like, he was like, what? Like, Fitz, yes, she was holding you down. Yes. What do you expect? Fitz, this old bewildered thing, I can't. He but you know like, what it is, though? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk out of the exact opposite my, side of my mouth. And I think it's something that, that Shonda does very effectively in all of the writers. I think it really is women sacrificing without anyone asking them to, mm-hmm. right? There's a difference if we sit down and, and let's say we're in a relationship, right? Uh-huh. And let's say you're going to go to grad school for film studies, right? And we sit down as a couple and we decide, okay, cool, I'm going to work while you're in school and then when you're done, then I'm going to go to grad school, right? Mm-hmm. And we talk and we agree, right? Then when you're done, you go, we're getting a divorce. I go, mm-mm, we had an agreement. That is different and now I can get on my soapbox and say, I sacrifice for you, so forth and so on because we actually had a meeting of the minds, right? The mistake Melly made is Melly sacrificed unilaterally. She did all of this without communicating, without consulting. So starting, and we, we don't need to go through all of the things, but obviously starting from the rape all the way up until now, all of the things that she keeps proclaiming that she sacrificed forfeits, Fitz never asked her to do any of them. Mm-hmm. And he just found out about them yesterday. Yeah. Well, not yesterday, but yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's her problem. And that's, I think, why she fi- feels so diminished. Because there was there was never any consent from the other side. There was no, there was no agreement because there was no bargain. Well, let us know what you guys think online. And we're going to talk about Cyrus in a bit uh, later on. But Huck and Javi. Mm. Oh, my gosh. Like, this is another emotional scene. Because we, t- we talked about this last week. We talked about how, um, I think you were talking about, Sophia, how uh, you were saying the parents need to watch their kids. No, what were you saying? That was oh, me. no, you. You were saying the parents need to watch their kids more. And, you know, because of this, the situation and maybe because the wife or his ex-wife, whoever she is, doesn't know exactly the extent of Huck's skills. Um, but as we see in this episode, like the son, like father, like son, like the son ends up going to the arcade, which they planned. And then he saw him there, even though he didn't go up to him. He saw him there. And then he comes to the office. And when he came into the office, I've tracked your IP address. I think we were all just like, what? And how did he get there? Uber? <laughs> But what I, the funny thing, cab. the funny thing you're saying it is because how old do you think? How old is he? Thirteen, right? At Did thirteen, I don't know. Maybe I said overprotective parents. My parents wouldn't let me go out by myself at thirteen. So I thought that when he got to the arcade, his mom was going to be there, and while he's looking in the window, she's like, "Huck," like you know what I mean? <laughs> like, what are you doing? I, I'm glad that it ended. Um I'm glad there were, it ended the way it did versus how we probably perceived or, or, or predicted that it would be. Um, but I do have to just, I, I just have to harp on this just for about about 20 seconds. The little boy, little junior, <laughs> Texas, or they're, they're communicating. See, mm-hmm. this, is, this is my problem that I mentioned last week. <laughs> Not only are you playing video games and you're doing online, but now you get to communicate. So you're playing a video game, and then you're also sending instant message to somebody that you don't know. There is no way in hell that Junior's mom should be allowing that boy to be playing video games online and have the opportunity to text people that you don't know. Terrible. Well, but that's. But, I mean, do you play video games? That's how I do. it goes, that's right? That's, that's, yeah. that's the that's the name of the game. I understand that, but this is a little boy, and she has no. He's 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 communicating. Oh my with, god, my parents would have never. He's been communi- able to, He's communi- kind of- Yeah, he's communicating with a killer. But I mean, but it's not a killer. Huck, true, Huck was at the arcade looking like a Chester. Mm-hmm. Yes, he was <laughs> looking creepy, but. And this, you can't, you can control your kids to a certain extent. And I'll be the first to say, I was the sneakiest little girl on the planet. I was sneaky. You couldn't, you could, you could try to control me, but as a child, you're going to do what you're going to do. And he can go to a friend's house and play the game and still chat on, there's ways to get around it if he really wants to. So I think it's also interesting. I think like parents aren't aware of what video games have become. Mm-hmm. Like I don't think parents are aware of like how much communication 
and social socialization goes on in video games yeah. today. Like, I mean, I, that's what I did for two hours before I came here. And it's like, <laughs> you know, the, video games have become a whole... I love that they use that storyline because I love video games. But also that it's like, that is... I, it's crazy that I got the most emotional seeing that scene where it's like, we're talking about like pixels and they're his like orc or whatever it is, like interacting with a little elf. And I was like, oh, I get it. Like I've, I've been there. I, I completely understand that. And I, I think that they, they just did it really beautifully. I don't know. I like no, that. And, and I actually have to piggyback on that and, and kind of jump back to what I said at the beginning of the episode. I think it, this is part of the reason that I think Scandal is the show that it is. I think it's part of the reason that it has the fan base that it does and arguably the most passionate viewers on television. Like we mm-hmm. we literally yeah. feel like we have ownership of the show. Yeah. And I think that part of the reason we ha- we feel like we have ownership is whether or not it's Huck, whether or not it's Abby or Olivia or whomever it is, everyone can relate with something on the show on such a guttural on a visceral level. Visceral yeah, level. Absolutely. That you're you it's almost as if when we watch Scandal, we are in a video game. That yep. it has become that real that there are avatars that we think we control. Oh yeah, you're a player in it. Absolutely. You, you're a player. Yeah. And I think it's it's brilliant and it's beautiful. I mean yeah. while we were watching the whole episode, I was just tweeting the whole time and it's just like it, I I can't get over how varied and interesting and wonderful a lot of the people the gladiators that watch the show are and how extremely supportive they are and it's like you know I wasn't I was in one scene in tonight's episode and it's like the amount of like tweets that I get and the amount of love that they show I feel like a star because <laughs> you are you, you are, are a star and we're definitely gonna to talk to you more about that but before we get into that now we're gonna but get show into- him some more love oh, while yeah. you're watching <laughs> gladiators Vanya Asher at Vanya Asher but After Buzz TV. <laughs> this episode, Olivia had so many scenes, so I, I have it all listed, so we're going to break this down. I'm going to have to take off my sweater. Right? Because it's about <laughs> to get hot. So we're going to start. She was talking to Fitz on the phone the first time. The first time she talks to Fitz, they're talking, and, you know, he's, she's like, oh, so now that's it, there's hope you don't call me every day now. I'm like, <laughs> Just like a dude when you tell him there's hope. When you see your old boo and he sees you looking good, and now he wants to call you every day. It's the same story. This is that same guy. He's like, oh, so because there's hope. It's, Fitz, I just told you that. No. <laughs> so when they're talking, talking on the phone, they're talking on the phone, and then immediately she asks, "I just want to know if Jake's okay because I researched and I saw that in this particular Max prison they don't feed their like all this stuff." And Fitz like, "What the hell? Like, <laughs> like, what are you talking about? We don't really need to go into that conversation." Then next, Tom, Olivia arranges to talk or get into the warden with David Rosen, who is not that prominent in this episode, but she finally got in contact with him. She doesn't want to see um, Jake, as we find out. She actually wants to see Tom. She sees Tom by taking over the warden's office so it can be off the record, so she thought, because obviously Rowan found her. But um, they're in the office and they're talking, and we have to dissect the scene with Tom. One, because we have seen more of Tom this season than we have Ever. ever. Yes. So the fact that in the last... I guess three three episodes. Yeah, he's gotten so much airtime, but like these long monologues, we're really starting to see him as an actor. Um, but this scene was so great. One because <laughs> Olivia went there with a purpose to find out if Jake killed the president's son, if Jake killed Harrison. If this was all really true, or if it was Rowan. But I love the passion that Tom had. One, how Tom looked at her when she first walked into the room, and he's like, "Wow." You are truly beautiful. I've never seen you, and you are beautiful. The face that launched a thousand ships. The face that launched a thousand ships. Like, I love that line. I, and I love it because he points, and he's like, you know, I'm always like this, doing the side hour. You go in quickly and have to like protect. But I've never like really looked at you. And he's like, I just, I, I just want to know, like, what is it? What is it that, you know, what did he say? He said, what is it that makes him love you so much? Why do you have so much power of him? And why did you leave him? And Olivia's like, wait, 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 wait. This is not my interrogation. <laughs> like, I came here to ask you some questions, but he would not let it go. My question is, though, even though I love that scene, do you think that Tom was smart to not tell Liv in that moment that Rowan was the one that did it? Hell yeah. yeah absolutely. I mean, Rowan got that poor man scared sh- shootless. I, I mean, I think he's damned if he does and damned mm-hmm. if he doesn't. You know, because yes, Olivia says she can protect him, but can she really? Can she really, really protect him? 
I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. But you know, that's I, I'm, I'm completely with you because I just don't see what the, what does he have to lose? He's already in, he's already in Supermax. He's already like Rowan's already. He has nothing to lose. At all, except his life. Like at yeah. the end, of the, you know. But is Rowan really going to save any, him? I think he's going to die at some point anyway. There's, I don't see him. I don't see him being the 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 deciding factor in whether Jake goes free or the blankets put on Rowan and him just just living his life throughout his olden days. I see him dying at some point anyway. But but that's why, and this is hard for me, given the fact that Brian was in this room and and his his scene today was ridiculously awesome, you kind of have to pick sides. So Mm -hmm. in that moment that Olivia said to him, I will protect you, theoretically, nothing changed from that moment to when he's basically in the the prison hospital room because he knows that Command is a killer. Mm -hmm. So just because now there's actually an eminent threat and he actually has, in fact, been shivved, doesn't change that beforehand you knew in fact you were a loose end so at that moment where cognizantly you knew you were a loose end you either decide to go down with rowan or to go down with jake Mm -hmm. so the fact that he then flips so quickly after being knifed there's a part of me that goes okay so you knew that before you're a soldier why now because now your death is more eminent Mm -hmm. i I, I think it it seems a little i I think uh, because liv said um what was her final words that she said to you better watch your back you better watch your back and so the fact that he but again but he, yeah. he already did yeah. that it, 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 this is the difference mm-hmm. this is the difference mm-hmm. I'm just gonna t- slightly change the scenario a little tiny bit it would be different if it was David mm-hmm. we're not talking about David we're talking about Tom not only was Tom the number one secret service agent assigned to protect the president of the United States of America he was also the golden child for command so he is like the elite of the elite. He arguably is 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 to juxtapose. He's Huck. He's that good in terms of that mental acuity, in terms of knowing how to do his job. At the moment that he gave up Jake, you go down with that ship. The minute again Olivia comes to you and asks you this 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 face that launched a thousand ships that everyone loves, including Command, he says. You don't tell her the truth at that moment. You tell her because now your death is more imminent. You were dead before. In that chair, in that prison, the minute you decided to kill the president's son, you're dead. We're going to come back to that scene because I, I, we have to talk about something else before we get to that. Um, but before we get to the scene I want to talk about, we have to talk about the other scene I want to talk about, what? which is the phone <laughs> sex scene. Oh. So Fitz and Olivia are talking on the phone, and yeah. <laughs> they're talking, and Fitz gives her the report about Jake, and then he asks, you know, she tells him <laughs> that she visited Tom in the cell, and they're ta- or in the warden's office, and they talk about this, and then... He says, you know, is there really hope? No, tell me, is there really hope? If there's hope, then come show me. And then he proceeds to tell her what he would do if she came over there. And they have, like, this scene, and they start playing the music that we all love. And I don't know, it was like, um... I wasn't feeling it. Oh, well, we we know. I wasn't either. And let me say why See, I wasn't feeling too, it. Let me say Sophia why, and I, we're all, like... I, I wasn't feeling it because she's having a moment with you where she says, listen... Tom told me that you tried to take your life away. And so to have a... Re- now, this is going back to what you you guys got on me last week because True. they don't have a real conversation. Are they? That's what you guys are saying. Now was the time to have a real conversation about something, and now he wants to talk about his his um, uh, um, peckerwood and, and how I'm going to lay it down on you, girl, and... Two two things for clarification. For clarification, when I was actually my point last week in talking about that they didn't know, they don't know about each other. They do actually know facts about each other, Mm -hmm. as everyone let me know all week. My point was is that there's a different type of knowing. Mm -hmm. There's a sexual knowing that isn't simply just sex. It really is that you you bond together with that other individual on a form of communication that isn't necessarily words or Mm -hmm. finding out where you went to school or if you were the captain of the swim team. That was actually my point. Mm -hmm. My point here, though, is that I think that it is completely different because I think that you have to take it 
in relation to the scene that we just saw with Tom, where Tom was like, why did you leave him? He tried to commit suicide. He went to your house, and there was a noise that I've never heard before. And basically, Tom had to break almost like the seal of privacy because he was so afraid of that noise, meaning like he was wailing probably... In, in a way that I don't know if, if some of you guys know, but I know that um, there are um, certain West African tribes that when their loved ones die, they do this wailing that literally will shake you to your core. And to me, that's what I thought. Then the fact that Tom says he tried to kill himself, and we've been discussing this all week. He wasn't simply killing himself because he lost his son. It was the loss of his son and the loss of Olivia together. That's what he couldn't handle. So in his mind, that is the only thing keeping him sane. So for her to basically say, you try to commit suicide, the only way that he can move forward and not stay in that space is by thinking that there is hope. By thinking that Helen of Troy, that if I can save you, if I can have you, then I will be king. I will be a god. My dynasty, my legacy, everything will be okay if I have hope with you. But if I have no hope with you, there is nothing. And so in that manner, even though, yes, it was, I don't care about what y'all say. It was, it was hot. hot. It was sexy. You even said that when she, you were telling us, right, something well, about just, was off yeah, script. I mean, Go, the, jump in. You know, the way that she oh. put her hand in, that was pure carry. <laughs> Which, again, to me, resonates on how much the actors are in the scene and in the moment. And it's so organic and it's so raw. I really think that's what, what Fitz was doing. Yes, there obviously is, the, is the, the tone of the sex and the sexuality. But I really think it's that she really is his beacon of light, of hope, of everything. And that's where she he was trying to get back to. And I'm thinking, he, sorry, I think they're both, I mean... That was, that was one of the reasons that I kind of like fell in love with the show but even before I auditioned for it where it's like I love the idea that the, the, in some way the two of them are each other's life sources like it's like they're just like a fountain of whatever for each other that keeps them going and I think like I'll, I don't know that's it, it, it's something that I always kind of like I under anything that happens between the two of them for some reason like that's not I'm like I get it like they're just kindred spirits and so like wherever they go I kind of go with the two of them well he needs to kindred spirit his butt to his attorney's office and file those divorce papers <laughs> because right I'm, I, 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 this is why it wasn't hot for me how you meet him is how he leaves you. That's I'm a true believer of that. There's nothing you can tell. You can talk. You can, we can have phone sex all you want to. Men in relationships always the kinkiest on, on, on the phone and via text messages. They're always the kinkiest. I'm not saying I'm speaking from experience. However, men in relationships always be all hot and bothered when they're talking to the other girl. If she's this beacon of hope, Fitz, and you were wailing and doing all of this stuff, and you know while she was gone, and you were really mourning the loss of the, the the love of your life leaving, why don't you be a man and take the initiative and put stuff in motion? Because if you're really not happy with with Melly and you really want out, just I don't understand why we're still doing this dance. Yeah, it was hot in regards to like. It was it was sexy in regards to just being you know in a sexual nature, but it wasn't sexy to me because your wife was upstairs, and it wasn't sexy to me because you you're not going to leave her. I mean, but his wife is upstairs, but they're a million miles away from each other. But They've he's been so that leave way. her. Right. Well, but he can't. Yes, he can. I mean, he can do he can do whatever he wants. But then the republic wants. will suffer. <laughs> Well, I'm just, you know, I'm just anti Fitz and Olivia. I don't think, I don't like them together. Well, I just okay, don't. Wait, time, I have a question for you. Do you not like them together given the fact that he's married, or do you not like them together in the totality? Like, let's assume that he was not married. I don't like them together because I really don't. I, there's, I haven't been shown that Fitz, I think Fitz feels the way he does about Olivia because it's better than what he has with Melly. I haven't oh. been shown, I haven't been shown. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. As Bam sips tea. As Bam sips tea. Maybe if he would take the, the steps to really leave his wife and, and, and be with Olivia and do those things to say, I want you in my life, then I'd be like, yes. That's 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 his soulmate. But I to me it kind of feels like 
it's one of those when you don't like your wife and you have a better option that becomes the love of your life. But if a better option besides hers come, comes around, is she going to be the love of your life too? And then after that, is the better option bef besides her going to be the love of your life too? Me. That's just me. I'm going to get slandered. Come on with the slander on social media. But really ask yourself, do <laughs> we think that he really loves Olivia because she's his soulmate? Or do is this just the best thing we've seen in comparison to what he already has? Yes, let us know. Tweet us. Um, yeah, I want to. You can tweet us, tweet us all on social media at, <laughs> hashtag, <laughs> at hashtag Scandal After Buzz. You guys can leave comments on YouTube. And again, going back to iTunes, you can leave comments on if you agree or disagree with uh, at Canelia's uh, statement. This on, studio me. will burn. They're going to burn me down. They're going to burn you down. down. Nothing to say right now. Burn me down. <laughs> you just killed it for us. Damn. I wrote on my notes, bitch, drunk fun. Phone sex scene is hot now. I just want to cross it out. Shit. <laughs> if it's hot to you, it's hot to you. Y'all can watch it again and well, you get know sweaty. You know what's interesting? I think, and I Goodness. didn't think about this, and Sorry. I could be wrong, actually. Is this the first time in a while that it's been hot for her? With him, like I feel like yeah, all the their interactions. The steamy, the steamy. They they did the little pinky thing where it was kind of a, ooh, but now she was ooh, it was different. You know, yeah, she like really she, felt it. I thought it was th that's something that I just mm -hmm. thought of that this is the first time in a long time that she's had a orgasm or something. Yeah, to him, it's a in response to something that he has said and done. Like they've been emotionally, you know, going like this, but yeah. like this is the first time that. <clears throat> She got all hot and bothered mm -hmm. in a yeah. while. I don't know if she had an orgasm, but she definitely got wet. That is not what an <laughs> orgasm looks like. Yeah. Yeah. She... Anyway. Um... You're supposed to say grown folk moments. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> the kids ain't watching this long. All right. So um, before we get back to Tom quickly, Rowan visited um, Olivia, and Rowan was talking to her, basically saying, you know, you shouldn't defy me. You went and saw uh, Tom, blah, 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 all these different things. And then she found out that Rowan is following her or has her followed and all these different things. After seeing that scene, did you guys think, I mean, I know I thought, did you guys think that Rowan was the one who had Tom shipped in the cell? Of course I did. I And, and everyone's going to be like, oh, it was obvious. It was not it was obvious not. to Sophia Stanley. I completely thought he did. Like, I was like, because, especially the fact that he knew. He's like, oh, you went and, and, and saw him? And to me, I thought it was not only a, a threat to Tom, I thought it was also a threat, threat to, to Olivia. Olivia. I obviously I also thought that it was Reverend Ike who did that, <laughs> but I didn't I didn't make notes that when Olive and her dad was having the conversation, did you see did you notice Olivia's neck mm -hmm. and how it was doing this little thing because she was so infuriated with her dad that she felt a, a way that she's probably never felt. She was pissed. She was really pissed at her dad and you can tell by the way she was breathing before she even turned around. She was pissed. So now when you go back and think about it, it makes sense. But initially, no, I, I didn't see that one coming. I don't think the actors did either. Yeah. Either I remember when we were at the read through, mm -hmm. everyone gasped, like including Carrie herself, and we're like, oh, it was shit. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of great twists and stuff. Like, and yeah. the, the reason why it worked so beautifully is just because by doing that, I forgot what I was going to say. Moving on. Mm -hmm. I'll you say want it online. Me to do the, my, my favorite thing that Carrie said, because I feel like Carrie's one liners are hitting in pocket in a mm -hmm. way that we haven't we we haven't seen in a, in a little bit. She goes, what's clear is you seem to have wasted a lifetime doing all the wrong things. So to me, it is beyond clear who she has chosen. Or let me rephrase it. It is clear that she has chosen the side against her father. And everything that we have seen with Rowan, we are going to see a fight that we have never seen before. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it is, it, it's going to be old scandal. It is going to be that type of where hide your children, hide your pets, hide everyone, because nobody is off limits. I think they're really going to go there. I just remember I was going to say, I was going to say, uh, and this will lead into the final point with this, uh, Tom. I feel like Olivia can be very persuasive. So I thought that Rowan did it because 
technically Olivia could go back and do that scheme multiple times and ev eventually way down on Tom where he finally confesses. So I thought, okay, Rowan's going to get out of the way, he's going to shove him, kill him, and then there's no chance of it coming out. Now, when we got to the scene with Fitz and Olivia, though, my favorite line from that scene is when Olivia say, you know, she said something to the effect of, I had to do it my father's way and do, take the B613 approach. Mm -hmm. And then that's when we were all like, oh my God. Like, I just wanted to applaud, give it a standing ovation because I just wasn't expecting that from this show. Did, I mean, did you think Tom was dead? I did. Yeah, me too. Yeah, we, I was already, like, I was like, oh, he didn't have to die. Totally. Yeah. But also, real quick, but then it also makes you go back to everything. Mm -hmm. Is she being sincere with Fitz? So if she's doing the command way, is she playing everybody? Like, how far back does this go? Mm. You mm. have to, you have to, to a certain extent, ask that question because we hadn't necessarily thought that she was that cold. But maybe she is. On a side note, real quick, somebody said, "Totally womp womp the lift." It's discussion. Dang, girl, I was so excited to. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, if it was hot, it was hot. Go watch it again. You know, I, it was good. Yeah, girl, get it. I mean, what do you? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, y'all. Don't drag me on social media. Well, no, what? Y'all no, can drag me. I got me. it last week. They it's can fine. Y'all can it's drag good. me. Yeah. yeah it's, it's fine. Mm -hmm. But one other thing that I found really interesting about Tom's monologue was that it it really, like, cemented my fear, fear of Rowan, where I was like, uh, oh. Like, it kind of, like, that little speech put everything into perspective for me in a way that I, like, I guess I just didn't see it before. And then when that was followed by by Olivia and Rowan's like meeting and the way that he spoke, I was like, oh, right. Like he's this thing, this shadow that's like always there and you don't understand. Like there was a moment before where I'd be like, I don't really understand the, the extent of his power. And then you're like, that's goddamn point. Like you don't understand what this man is capable of. And you kind of and we might never, you know, I don't know what we will see we might never understand it but that's like this was one of the, the last episode in this one where it was one of the first times where I was like oh I'm like truly I get it I'm afraid of him now yeah I think besides Rowan one person that we've always even before Rowan came on the show that we were like we don't know he's capable of is Cyrus absolutely and yeah. on the show you play Cyrus's assistant mm -hmm. so tell us about the process what season did you join Scandal I joined in the second season in the last second season, season. Yeah. so what was it like because between Scandal Season 1 and Scandal Season 2, the show, like, just grew dramatically. What was it like being cast in the show? Wait, what show? am I talking about? I came on, what, what season are we working on now? Four. 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 I came on the third season. Oh, so you came, like, there when it was go. really, like, yeah. really, like, at, what was it like being cast in the show that, like, everybody was talking about? Well, it was crazy. Yeah. Because I was a huge fan of the show, and I'd, like, watched it all, and... Then to actually have gotten like an audition for it, I was like, "Oh, this is this is so fun!" Like you don't often get to, as an actor in Los Angeles, you don't often get to audition for things that you truly love. So this was like an amazing opportunity. But it was also, and sometimes when you're auditioning for things, it can be like weeks or it can just take like a really long time mm -hmm. until something comes to fruition. There's like callbacks and blah blah blah. But with Scandal, I auditioned for it on Thursday. I remember. <laughs> And my best friend coached me for it. And then the next day, we were sitting out by a pool. And I got a phone call. And that was it. And I was on set on Monday. And it just kind of, like, happened like that. Yeah. And then and I didn't really, you know, with, as with everything scandal-related, you have no idea. You're just kind of thrown into it. You don't understand what direction it's going to go. And I knew it wasn't going to be only one episode, but I had no I couldn't have possibly dreamt that it was going to be extended for this long. So they so they told you that when you got the role that it was reoccurring? I knew that it was going to be in two episodes. Okay, two episodes. I think that that's what it was at mm -hmm. the time. Yeah. And then it kind of, it just, yeah, it mm -hmm. became something else. And I think, I, I mean, I it was, I remember the from the first day that I was, that I was working with Jeff, it was just like the two of us just really got along mm -hmm. in every which way like he's such a father figure and he's so amazing in real life and he's such a like a giving actor a uh, wonderful person but then when he when that voice goes <laughs> it's really easy to play across from him because you're just like you're just, you're just a re half the time I'm just like I am just reacting to mm -hmm. a man that I am again not sure what the extent of his power is and I think that that's something like that you know, obviously, like over the course of the la of the last season, where 
sometimes he would involve me into things that made that you know like a regular intern or aide or I'm, I was a junior policy advisor. That's what the character description was. Mm-hmm. Just so um, that a regular like young intern working at the White House wouldn't know. Like over the course of the season he would like try to involve me in stuff and I would fail and that was like part of it too you know it's like why is why is Cyrus keeping somebody around that has a lot to learn and that's kind of like maybe failing all the not all the time but you know it's like there's always like this like eager naivete around about the character where I'm like trying to please but then like uh, and fail uh, don't fire me will you fire me but that that I think it's interesting because that's a testament to to another side of Cyrus Mm -hmm. that we're, I think, seeing this season as well, which is that he is not just a monster. He's able to go into, like, incredible places, incredibly dark places, but then at the same time he, there are clearly soft spots in his heart. I think Ethan is, has been now for a season and, and a half, a clear testament of, like, a soft spot in his heart, and then the relationship that he's getting into now is another testament as well that this this man it has human weaknesses and i don't know yeah it's it's great it's super fun to be a part a part of that and a part of that um world. Well, the the table read so um there's always tweets about oh my god we just you know we just finished a table read yeah, yeah. can you tell us can you kind of take us into what it's really like um, being a part of the table read because yeah. they seem to be this you know this monumental well, thing well they're 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 very stressful mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. most of the time, not most of the time, every time that I've been at one, mm-hmm. you get the, like the script. The actors are there before the scripts, mm-hmm. like they're literally like printing them off and putting putting them down for everyone. So everyone is literally reading. Besides, obviously, the writers and some of the producers, the actors are finding out about what's going to happen in this episode mm-hmm. for the first time, which means you know love scenes death scenes which i'm always like i'm gonna go this one Some, something's gonna happen <laughs> gonna, i get fired or killed but so it's 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 very straight like half the time i'm just like like don't don't pass out do you know what i mean because it, it's so tense and like everyone's energy in the room and it's such a family obviously but everyone is so excited everyone is gives it their all even at the table reads that it's hard not to get like swept away by the energy, and half, half the time I like leave with a headache because I'm paying, you know, you're just like sitting there, like paying such close attention. Because, as you know, like when you watch the show, and the, I think we always joke about like the scandal hangover. Mm-hmm. Like I get it in at the read-throughs, let alone like to actually like go to work and like shoot some of the scenes. And with when you're working with Cyrus, you get a hangover because <laughs> it, it gets he yells a lot. <laughs> And then is it is it also true that like for you guys sometimes you guys are shooting on set like 13 14 15 16 hours? Yeah, but that's I think that that's that that's not a first for me. There's other stuff that you know, I think it's super grueling for the regulars mm-hmm. where those hours can get really extended and I think Abby did a um I think Darby did a really uh, a great post on like Quora or something mm-hmm. that you guys can or the gladiators can look up where it's like she explains what the schedule is like and you know you start early on a Monday and then as the week progresses the start times like get later and later but the amount of hours still stay the same amount so sometimes mm-hmm. you're working like into the night towards the end of the week so there's the weekend is not really a weekend for them like for me it's so you know I come in like I do my thing get to hang out with everyone it's the best thing in the world yeah but but um yeah for them the hours can get kind of kind of intense but that happens on other shows too for sure for sure now speaking of other shows uh you're working on other shows now like i am uh, yeah. the comeback which is coming back yeah. to hbo yeah. how's that going the comeback is amazing we just had the premiere last night and that was my first like premiere and red carpet experience yeah and i'm a little bit hungover <laughs> but it was really fun um it was great and it was it was such a different experience working on a comedy um a dramedy um, which is like a half an hour show, and it's just shot very differently because it's kind of like a. If for people who don't, you don't know what the show is, but it's Valerie Cherish, who's a, sort of a failed sitcom star. The first season, which was ten years ago, mm-hmm. was about her like making a comeback by like deciding to do a reality show, and this was way before reality mm-hmm. shows were a thing. 
and before the audience audiences had an understanding of what a, an actress could do in a reality sh show and so you know it became a huge cult hit since and so this season is all, is about gets even more meta it's like she gets what she never thought she would get she gets a part in an hbo show a real drama but it's about like a terrible version of her so it's like super meta and it's hilarious and we saw the first two episodes last night and i'm really proud of it and i can't wait for people to see it and it airs starts airing this sunday sunday november 9th and That's that stars right. uh, uh lisa kudrow lisa kudrow mm -hmm. who's also on scandal lisa last kudrow. season right yeah who yeah. was and i never got a chance to actually like to see her on set so that was really crazy to actually yeah then to yeah. work with lisa it's like how the cycle of life right i know right <laughs> can you can you also tell us about your horror film that's coming out sometime next year that yeah, stars that you called, and aaron eckhart um um it stars aaron eckhart and i make an appearance in it but mm -hmm. i get to play something that i've wanted to play something scary that i want to play for a long time mm -hmm. um and it's called incarnate um <clears throat> yeah and it's a blumhouse film that comes out Next year. Scary film, yeah, we're so the same. Yeah. Why did I get scared too? Yeah. Just the name alone, and I'm like, no, no. <laughs> like your whole demeanor changed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I cannot do horror films. No. I like horror Tell films. us the name of it again. It's called Incarnate. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then just really quick, what I think is really fascinating about uh, your journey here, you've only actually been here for three years, correct? Yeah, officially for three, th just a little bit over three years. And yeah. then where, where, where are you from? Well, originally I'm from Croatia. Mm -hmm. I was born in, in Zagreb. And I lived in, in Croatia and Bosnia, and then my family moved over to Canada. With, there was a, a big war that mm -hmm. affected the area, so we moved over to Canada, and uh, I grew up there and went to a, a, an alternative arts program that kind of saved my life. And then, and then, yeah, I decided to make the jump down here. And Did you watch Degrassi growing up? I, I watch it here and there. I wasn't as big of a fan of it as I think, like, there's, like, bigger fans here than there are even in Canada. But yeah. 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 Canadian. I love how that's every everyone <laughs> goes Degrassi, right? And it's like, yeah. <laughs> so where Drake started up. Yeah. <laughs> I know there's that's not. Yep. I know there's not. There's not too much you can reveal. But is there any like you're reoccurring? So mm -hmm. we're assuming that we'll see you again for uh, be, season four. I will be back. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, is there anything you can tell us without getting in trouble? Or we'll, like, is there something you could tell us? I Gilles? do think if you loved tonight's episode, mm -hmm. and it seems that a lot of people did on. Twitter as well. It's moving in the next two episodes and what's the the mid season finale. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. Okay, and then will we see more of you and Ethan, the character of Ethan? Before the end of the season, yes. Okay. Okay. I have, I, have a, I have a prediction too for okay. you. Oh, well then I'll, I'll let you do it because yeah. I think we have the same prediction. Yeah. For, for what? I have a for prediction. Me? You, for no, no, I have a prediction for your character. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm super <laughs> That's excited. That's what we try now. to do. We try to look yeah. at your facial expressions yeah. and, and figure things out that we're not supposed to know. Well, I, yeah, let me know because I'm still trying to figure <laughs> out. So, <yeah. laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to go uh, into you. predictions now. Oh. oh shoot! Darn it! I didn't do that. Now, before we do, let me wait. Till, hold on. TV predictions. Oh my God! There's a light show. Yeah, too. there's a light the show that happens time. too. Rewind. Before we do predictions, <laughs> we are now going to do Cornelia's cold piece of the week. This week, I'm going to uh, give cold piece of the week to Miss Olivia Pope. And mainly because, number one, she had a man shanked. <laughs> I didn't see that coming. I know you guys didn't see that coming. Mm -hmm. She is definitely stepping up, and she is becoming the Olivia that we were introduced to in season one. The one who took the tire iron and uh, broke mm -hmm. Abby's husband's legs when she found out that, she was, um, be that he was being abusive to Abby. So... On top of everything else that we've seen, she's standing up to her father. She is back. And we always say, you know, Olivia's gut is off or whatever. I think it's becoming less about her gut and just more about the person and her taking an initiative and, and standing up to what she feels like is the problem and getting what she wants. So for that reason, I'm giving Olivia Pope cold piece of the week. I love it. And don't forget to let us know who your cold piece of the week is. Just do hashtag cold piece and make sure you tweet us. Or you can do it on iTunes and YouTube as well. Um, but now we will go into predictions. After Buzz TV predictions. Oh, we ain't get no lights this time. All right. <laughs> um, so predictions, predictions, predictions. I want to hear your predictions, guys. <clears throat> this is not necessarily a prediction, but what if Jake really did do it? Like, what if he really did do this? I'm 
gonna, I'm gonna lean towards that because I don't know. It's just something that seems too clean cut with it being Papa Pope and he's just this bad guy, rah, 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 and he, you know, and I can do what I want and this whole Reverend Ike thing that Bam keeps talking about. <laughs> I kind of want to say I think Jake had something to do with it. Huh. And he is a, this sneaky little guy. Okay. I really like where you're going with that, actually. Mine is a two-part. I think that when Tom said, you don't have a father, you have a command, I don't think that's true. I don't care what anyone says. In some small place, Rowan loves his daughter. Mm -hmm. And by her choosing them over him wasn't simply command. I think it it broke his heart. To me, the worst thing to do is to break the heart of a monster because you reminded him that he had a heart. So now he has to basically extract all emotion from himself, and in order to do that, he has to destroy you. So it's going to get messy. I know who's going to win, but it will get messy before Olivia wins, possibly. And then uh, my other prediction, I'll actually let you do it because I think we have the same prediction. And if not, then I'll say it. Uh, well, before that, you know, I predicted that, you know, Rowan, Reverend Ike needs to die. But I think with the fact of them now joining forces, that's too predictable. So maybe Reverend Ike may not die after all um, because, you know, he's going to the other show. But, okay, this may sound shady. But I, I see something with Ethan the character Ethan and Cyrus. Um, there is something... You look like a better, younger version of James, if that makes sense. Oh, that's character. Where I was going. Your character. Oh, I did so kinda, yeah. I, hmm. So I do wonder, after Cyrus realizes that he's been played, I wonder if we're going to see more of Ethan. And your only connection is to Cyrus. So... Huh. I don't know. I'm just... That wasn't my prediction, but you want to go first or you want me to go? I'm going to go ahead. Okay, my prediction, that was so not my prediction, so that's a good one. I have to think about that. Um, my prediction is that Ethan, especially because of how, how you were just talking about how he kind of fails and, and Cyrus keeps giving him another opportunity, Ethan is going to step up, he's going to figure out what's going on, and he's going to save Cyrus. Something is about to blow up, there's going to be a scandal, and Ethan is somehow going to jump in front of it, take the blame. Something is going to go on where Ethan will either martyr him, himself and or save the day. There, there's a reason that his character has been around for as many episodes as it, as it has, especially given the dichotomy uh, of he's always kind of failing and Cyrus is always giving him another opportunity. He's going to rise to the occasion. He's going to save Cyrus. And then we're going to see a completely different relationship or not, but he's going to save him. And then for me, um, I don't really have a prediction. It's just more I need to know what these photos of Olivia have to do with anything. I need that to oh, be wrapped true. up. And I'm assuming it's gonna, we're going to find out within the next two episodes, so I'm excited for Not that. Not at all. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to find out. Anyway, uh, where can we find you guys? First, where can we find you on social media? Uh, at Vaughn Asher. Perfect. You can find me at Bam Erickson. Sophia Stanley at Canelia and at Emil Ennis Jr. and on YouTube Chasing LA guys it was a pleasure once again Vanya thank you so much for coming in make thank sure you, you check so him out for having me. every single week on Scandal guys we love you so much and make sure you tweet us and all that good stuff alright bye from executive producers Maria Menounos Kevin Undergaro Phil Svitek and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network to watch or listen to other after shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. Buzz you later. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principal.